Yeah, hello, hi everyone. Yeah, what makes them happy? First of all, I want to say I am very happy to have the opportunity to talk to you, to speak about my topic here at the conference. My name is Juliane, and I'm working as a freelance cybersecurity for about six years now. I have a background in web development uh, with a focus on PHP, but that lies behind me. Now I am in the field of cybersecurity. And when I started in that field, I was, was dealing a lot with explaining the shift left approach to different development teams in an international telecommunication company. And I helped them uh, to onboard security scanning tools and understand the reports. And after a while, I saw that many of the teams dealt with similar problems, had similar topics. And I felt that it would be good to connect them because they didn't know about each other and uh, the challenges they had. And I also learned that security is also a matter of culture. Maybe that's something you also experienced. So that's what leads me here. So I'm going to talk about security culture today, what in my opinion is a good security culture and how it can be fostered while having human psychology in mind. But before we dive into the topic, I want to tell you a little story. By the way, the images in my presentation are AI generated. So this is not the original cake that I made. Um, ah, I, you don't know. You don't know yet that I, I will tell you about the cake. And some of the images are a bit funny, but I think that's okay as well. So a while ago, I was baking a cake and I put in all the ingredients like butter, eggs, milk, a pinch of salt, flour, baking powder. And it was a simple cake. It looked very tasty. And I was really looking forward to having that cake with my family in the afternoon. So I picked up my son from kindergarten and told him about the cake we were going to have for coffee time. I don't know if coffee time is a thing here, but in Germany, coffee stunde, we, some families like to have that. And when we sat down at the table, he took the first bite and his face grimaced. And he said, Mom, that doesn't taste good at all. And I took a bite as well, and indeed, it did not taste good. I had forgotten to put in sugar into my cake. So my son was devastated, and I was devastated too. Coffee time was ruined. So as I'm going to talk about security culture, what does it have to do with my sugarless cake? Imagine me trying to put sugar into the cake after baking it. It's very hard. And imagine to add security to a company that is already operating or a software that is already in production. Yeah, it is very hard as well. <laughs> so in the first part, I want to quickly go over some observations regarding cybersecurity and culture. So let's have a really short facts and figures section. Uh, last year, Accenture conducted a survey among a thousand CEOs of large international organizations, and the results show that the CEOs are fully aware about cybersecurity and the threats to their business from cyber attacks. But interestingly, almost three quarters lack confidence in their organization's ability to avert or minimize those attacks. And that also reflects their uncertainty on how to priori prioritize the investments in cybersecurity. So the majority of the CEOs um, see cybersecurity as a technical function that is in the responsibility of the CIO or CISO and put a strategic focus on compliance and, and on episodic interventions. And at the same time, see, um, organizations globally invest more and more into IT security products. You can see that orange line that is going up in that chart. And while the number of reported breaches continues to increase massively, and that is the black line that you can see. The graph shows um, the numbers from 2007 to 2024. Um, and from 2019, we have, we have the numbers till 2019, and from there it's estimations. But the direction is very well visible here. And to add another fees, piece of facts and figures, according to the Verizon Data Breach Investigations report from last year, maybe you read that, 
um, 74% of the successful cyber attacks exploited human weaknesses like misconfigurations, misuse of permissions, use of stolen credentials, and social engineering. So what can we derive from that? I can see two interesting points. So spending more money on tools does not help to increase the security in the way wanted. That's the first, first thing. The second is humans seem to be the weakness attackers are going for. And that is why we speak of the human defense layer or human risk management. To come back to my little story from the beginning, buying more tools seems like sprinkling sugar over the already baked cake or like injecting it could also be a way to put sugar in the cake afterwards. However you add the sugar afterwards, it is not an integral part of the cake structure. And transferring that to cybersecurity, does that mean that it is impossible to add security to an already existing and operating organization? Of course not, but it's not a piece of cake to have a little word play here. So if tools are not enough and sharing information about security threats, security and threats is not enough, what is? And the answer lies in a term that is rising in the security industry, it is security culture. Security culture means a change in behavior towards cybersecurity and cyber threats. The Accenture study found that cyber resilience CEOs, only 5% by the way, implemented a security-oriented culture, starting with awareness at the highest levels and including everyone in the organization. It is worthwhile mentioning that every organization already has a security culture, regardless of the maturity or whether it is good or bad. The goal is to engage it and shape it in a way that it helps the, the organization to become resilient to cyber threats. And resilient means detect threats faster, contain threats faster, remediate fast, and stay ahead of the curve. Cybersecurity is in many cases reactive, so organizations learn how to become cyber resilient after a breach has happened. And we all know that this is bad in many ways. It is super expensive, it's a dent in the reputation of the organization, and it's also very, very stressful um, to, to get the situation under control. And another interesting thought uh, brought up by Manuel Pais, Pais, I don't know how his name is pronounced, maybe you know him. Uh, security culture also serves to solve the one in 100 problem. He refers to the number of security experts facing the number of developers they help to integrate security. And that number tends to be usually 1 to 100. If you're interested to reading the article, I share the references uh, on the last slide. So the centralized cybersecurity team tends to become a bottleneck for all the necessary activities to build a strong security posture. And by making security a shared responsibility, the load is taken off that centralized team and everyone is in the responsibility of increasing the security posture. Application development teams, for example, then are tasked to own the security of their own applications, of their own products, of their own work, which makes perf perfectly sense because they know best how their application works, how it is integrated into the application landscape of an organization, uh, what kind of data are processed, how it is operated, and so on. So why exclude security from their responsibility? They don't exclude code quality, and they also don't exclude performance as another non-functional requirement. It is odd that security is excluded or shifted to the far right. So, but enough with the facts and figures. My question now is, what is a good security culture? And it will not surprise you that there is no common understanding about what a good security culture is. And we can use this audience to make a quick survey about it. I prepared Mentimeter for us. Uh, it's a real-time um, survey tool. So please, if you want to participate in the survey, scan the QR code. Or if, if it feels safer for you, you can go to menti.com and enter the code. And then you should see a question appearing on your phone. 
And Andre can maybe show the screen. Yeah, so what fits best for a good security culture? You have five options. Is it, I cannot read it, compliance? Is it having awareness? Is it shared responsibility? Is it establishing formal groups that can help to increase security or is it security embedded throughout the organization? Okay, I can see there are not many fans of compliance in this group. <laughs> <laughs> Shared responsibility, very strong, okay. And security embedded throughout the organization. That's exactly what we are going for here, yes. Ha, ooh, ooh, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> That's also okay. Good. I think we get a picture here. Thanks a lot. So we can uh, switch back to my presentation. So yeah, really interesting. Um, Forrester Consulting has conducted a study um, about security culture in global organizations, and I, I show you the re results now. The answers given in the in the survey were actually totally individual, but Forrester made categories from that. And those are the categories I showed you in our survey. Yeah, and uh, what we can see is that they were fans of compliance. Compliance is the strongest, um, strongest uh, way for a good security culture, in their opinion. In the second position, we have having awareness and understanding of security issues, issues with almost a quarter of the answers. On the third place, recognition that security is a shared responsibility. And on the uh, fourth position, the establishing the formal groups. And on the last position, security embedded throughout the organization. So it's really quite the opposite of that, what we saw in our results. That's interesting. And we can see from those results that the understanding of the term security culture is diverse and that there are different approaches to implement a security culture. The most holistic one is the last one, where security is embedded throughout the organization and what we are fans of, apparently. That sounds good, but what does it actually mean? At what point is a security culture embedded throughout the organization? Thinking about that, I realized that a security culture is nothing where a specific point can be reached. We have to see it as a continuous process that evolves and changes over time, where adaptions can and should be made, and regardless of the specific activities that express the security culture, there has to be an agreement and common understanding that the human defense layer exists and that it needs to be part of the defense in depth strategy. It does not help to neglect it. So, and a good security culture leads to all of the other definitions we saw. I must admit, when I started, um, when I was tasked to foster a security culture or a cultural change for security in my engagement for the international telecommunications company, I did not think much about the kind of security culture I wanted to implement. It was clear to me that the security culture I had in mind was meant to improve the security posture of the organization in a sustainable way. And to achieve that, security had to be on all levels, from new hires to top management, carried by all and everyone in the organization. One of the core values, something positive, seen as an opportunity to grow and shape, instead of something that is annoying and or something people had anxiety. Yeah. So I was reaching for the stars, I think. And I have to decrease the scope a bit from that, because the level I am operating at is with the application development teams. So I'm not talking about general awareness, like being prepared for phishing attacks, which also belongs to that area. Uh, I'm fo focusing on secure software development and the security mindset, a security culture amongst developers. I think that is um, important to mention. So what do we do to implement a good security culture? 
an organizational culture can be described as a collection of values, beliefs, ethics, and attitudes that characterize an organization and guide its practices. And to reach the goal of a culture where security is embedded throughout the organization, we need to understand that we are going for a behavioral change. And to foster this change, we need to help people understand why security matters for the organization. Involve and engage people and help them see how they can contribute. Encourage them to own the security of their applications or products or processes or whatever, what they are working on. Uh, build a positive relationship between the security organization and other parts of the organization and communicate in a way that other people can understand us and not kill them with jargon. In the talk before my talk, for example, people didn't know what threat modeling is. If you throw that at them, that's not a good start. You have to take them with you if you want to do what you want, want them to do. And yeah, research has extensively shown that it is not enough to appeal to people's rational mind to initiate a change in behavior. I'm convinced that every one of you has personal experience with that if you think of your last New Year's resolution. So did you integrate it into your life? If so, well done, good job. Um, the truth for most people is that it is really hard to change behavior. So it is hard to eat healthier. It is hard to do more sports. It is hard to quit smoking. Um, yeah. And regardless of the good reasons, you definitely know and have heard so many times in your life. It is just hard to change behavior. The psychology professor Jonathan Haidt has found a good picture for this, the elephant and the rider. I don't know if you've heard of that picture already. The elephant stands for the emotional side, for the unconscious, while the rider represents the rational mind. And it is obvious in this picture that the rider is inferior in size and strength compared to the elephant. The rider cannot just decide on something and then direct the elephant according to this decision. The elephant will move where it feels best. And oftentimes, the elephant goes for short-term satisfactions, like eating a chocolate bar, uh, smoking a cigarette, or in a business scenario for software-driven companies, it is much more enjoyable to build a new software feature than updating the documentation. Maybe you can imagine. So the long-term goals, like staying healthy till old age or take security precautions in the possible event of a security breach, are kind of boring for the elephant. So the rider has to find ways to make those long-term goals interesting. And in our endeavor to foster a security culture, this means for us that we need to find ways to turn the rational security is important for the organization into something that catches people's interest and makes it not only a rationally understandable statement, but something they can experience, they can relate with, they can integrate into their own value system. And that's the point where we have to think about motivation. What does motivate people? Or how I phrased it in the title, what makes them happy? So, ah oh yeah, okay. Psychological studies have shown that there are three innate human needs that are essential for promoting personal growth, constructive social development, and personal well-being. And those are autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Autonomy in this context refers to the feeling of volition, of being able and trusted to decide and act self-determined, to make your own, cho own choices. Competent means the feeling of being confident at what someone is doing, the good feeling of being ex an expert and knowing what you're doing. And relatedness is the feeling of security in social interactions, of feeling supported and well cared for, of feeling belong. Nourishing those three needs has been found to foster both intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. If we appeal to those innate psychological needs, we might be able to motivate people to deal with security topics and integrate them into their habits and values, thus become part of a good security culture. 
And I want to take a closer look at the theory of motivation with you, with this uh, graph here. No, not, it's not a graph, a picture. Uh, so the American psychology professors and researchers Richard M. Ryan and Edward L. Dickey developed the self-determination theory about motivation and created the scale. On the left-hand side, we see the intrinsic motivation, which is the motivation type with the highest degree of self-determination and integration. An example for that would be a kid playing just for fun, just for the experience of satisfaction. On the other hand, on, on the other end of the scale lies a motivation. That means that the person is not acting or acting without any intent. A motivation results from not valuing an activity, not feeling competent to do it, or not expecting it to bring the desired outcome. And an example for that would be an employee who doesn't see the point in participating in a mandatory training session and as a result puts in no effort and shows no interest in the activity. In between those two types, there are the extrinsic motivational states with different degrees of regulatory styles. Regulation here refers to the driver of motivation. So let's quickly go over that. External regu regulation means just satisfying a demand coming from outside. An example for that would be um, our employee participating in the mandatory training only to get a bonus or to avoid punishment while they don't find it interesting or fulfilling in any way. The introjected regulation involves taking in a regulation but not fully accepting it as one's own. Drivers for the motivation can be guilt, shame or the need for self-approval. It is driven by internal pressure. So to stay with our example, the employee attends the workshop because they would feel guilty if they didn't go and want to avoid feeling like a failure in their own eyes. The next stage is the identified regulation, and that involves the individual identifying with the value or importance of, an, of a behavior. The behavior is performed because the individual personally endorses it and sees it as important for achieving personal goals. In our example, the employee puts in extra effort during the mandatory training because they believe the training is important for their professional growth and aligns with their career goals, even if it's not inherently interesting. And the integrated regulation is the most autonomous form of extrinsic motivation, where, where the behavior is fully integrated with the individual self-concept and values. The behavior is performed because it's congruent with the individual's other values and needs. In our example, the employee attends the workshop because continuous learning and self-improvement are integral to their identity and long-term personal and professional goals. The self-determination continuum, that's what that is called, has been investigated in different studies with school children, and the results show that the more autonomous its extrinsic motivation is, the more engagement and better performance could be seen. And reading about those studies, I felt the truth of those outcomes. And maybe you can relate too, um, and think of situations where control and pressure decreased your will to contribute while the freedom to make your own choices and create something, find your own solution for a problem, motivated you. So learning about that scale, I understood that we are operating in the field of extrinsic motivation with different degrees of regulation. And I say that because initially I thought about how to awaken our developers' intrinsic motivation to deal with cybersecurity. So on the level where the kid is playing just for fun, but I think it's appropriate and adequate to uh, work, to operate in the field of extrinsic motivation. I wouldn't go that far that it is really intrinsic. Um, and of course, we want to shift, what direction is, left, <laughs> as far as possible with our message, uh, security is important for the organization. Ideally, we go for those two states, the, yeah, 
uh, identified and the integrated regulation. That would be our goal to operate here. Yeah, so how do we motivate people to contribute? Our first goal was to break down barriers. And it is often said that cybersecurity resides in an ivory tower and from time to time the security experts descend and speak in tongues about finding CVEs and assessments and they demand the integration of various security scanning tools and ask for architectural documents. So the application teams usually defeat those demands uh, and requests with reference to already defined timelines and budgets for the delivery of business requirements and nothing moves forward in this scenario. Breaking down those barriers meant for us to build a relationship between the security team and the application teams on eye level. We might be the security experts, but they are the experts for their application. So we have to work together to improve security. We wanted to show the application teams that we weren't their enemy, but instead their helpful friend, helping them to understand and to fulfill the security requirements defined by the organization. In our activities for establishing a positive security culture, we focused on three areas. So building a positive relationship to the application development teams, to the developers, providing guidance via training and knowledge sharing, and facilitating peer-to-peer -peer activities and building a community. And I will show you what we did in those three areas. So in the beginning, we really had a lot of one-to-one -one meetings with the application teams where we explained the shift-left approach for secure software development, and we enabled them hands-on to integrate ZAST scans wherever possible. It went so far that we asked for repository access and triggered the scan on our own Jenkins server. And re we really tried to, to get that going. And then, of course, in the next step, we helped them to understand the findings and the reports so they could start analyzing them and remediating them. It was really important to help them to, to prioritize the findings because when you scan a legacy application for the first time, you get very likely hundreds and thousands of findings. And that is really demotivating <laughs> for the development teams. So it was important for them to understand that the number can be decreased with a really structured approach. approach. And we did not just leave them with a ton of findings, but we developed a remediation strategy with them. We could always see that this took a load from their shoulders, and they appreciated it really a lot when we took the time and dove into the code with them. And that was usually the point where the ice broke, when they realized that we understand the code, that we can read it, and that we really know what we are talking about. So this hands-on work really helped us to build trust. And as much work as this was for us at the beginning, that meant sometimes more than 20 reoccurring meetings per week with 40 development teams, that was really a lot, it paid off for the years to come. The connections we built there, and that's now five years ago, or six, um, the connections are still in place and reliable, even though there was a bit of fluctuation in all of the teams. In the area of guidance, we tried different things. We offered, at the beginning, an in-person training about the foundations of secure software development. And this went well for a while, but it was not mandatory. So after a while, it was hard to find enough participants for that. And at the same time, the effort on our side uh, on, as a security team for preparation and organization of the trainings were enormous. So we paused that. And to better scale the training, we tried something else. We bought a hands-on training software um, and although the quality of the training software was really good and it, it was hands-on and you could really um, try to break into something and then afterwards fix it. So it was really, um, yeah, hands-on training. Yeah, although it was very good, the same problem remained here. It was not mandatory. And so people did not take the time to complete it. And so this tool remained almost unused in our tool landscape, which is really sad. 
Um, and this is another perfect example for trying to solve a problem with a tool before having the right mindset established in the organizations. But, okay, that's a lesson that we had to learn and money that we had to pay. <laughs> we recently took another leap with in-person training and piloted an in-person threat modeling training for a small group of security interested people. And this is aligned with our overall plan to integrate threat modeling in, as one of the core activities for security assessments. And we are even trying to introduce threat modeling into the agile software development process. So this is, is a plan for this year to, to try that. And our goal is um, that the people we trained with threat modeling then take over the task for other teams as well, not only for their own team, but help other teams to do threat, mod threat modelings and, um, yeah, to, to take a bit over from our work. To provide guidance, we also introduced an internal newsletter. In each edition, we focus on one topic that we explain as extensively as needed with own knowledge articles or references to internal or other external Sources, topics were, for example, the different scanning types like SUST, SCA, DUST, IS, container scanning, but also topics like threat modeling, cloud security, misconfigurations, open source, things like that. At the end of each newsletter, we place a quiz so people can engage and show that they understood the topic. And everyone who answers the quiz correctly is then mentioned in the next edition. So we give them an opportunity to engage here and also to get public recognition. We also invite uh, people from outside of our team to write knowledge articles about their areas of expertise, and we give them a platform to show their competence and get visibility in the company for their topic. The idea behind the newsletter is to skill up but also to deliver the knowledge directly into their email boxes. So they don't have to do anything but read and click, click and read the other way around. So they don't have to go to some knowledge base or so, but they just open their email box. Good idea. Yeah, and we invited developers to inspirational sessions with speakers from outside the company. So from so ideally known security uh, people from security world. And with that, we hope to inspire the, the application teams and broaden their horizon. And the last thing we did in that area, uh, recently we established a knowledge base um, in Confluence. That was the developers wish to use Confluence for that. Uh, we document the knowledge we share there and it's also collaborative. So everyone can contribute for the third area community and peer-to-peer -peer activities, we established a shared communication channel in teams and we invited people across all development teams to join the so-called security champions network. We tried to implement a security champions program um, and that is still in the making, but the name is already there. So security champions network, that is already there. And in this communication channel, everyone can post, comment, or show reactions. And we make sure to post something once or twice per week, so it is lively. And we also encourage the members of the Security Champions Network to post. If we see that they, they might have a topic that could be interesting, we push them a little bit to write about it. Yeah, our goal is, of course, to give them a platform for... Um, getting in touch with each other, for showing the knowledge, and also to give them a safe space for their questions and ideas and help them to gain visibility in the network. For the latter, we initiated another knowledge sharing format. Uh, format besides the inspirational session, we have the so-called developer session. And here a member of the network presents in a hands-on demo session on their security topics. Security topics that they are dealing with in their everyday work life. And it's really important that it is not a big presentation. It's really a demo session where they usually show a command line and show things they, they do and that they, that happen on their laptops. Um, 
And that is intentionally that way because we don't want them to spend too much time creating a presentation. We have a, a presentation template where we can fill in some best practices, but the focus really is on the demo. Yeah, this contributes to the peer-to-peer -peer recognition, of course, sometimes even leads to management attention, and it opens up a space for the network members to show their competence. The participation rate for those sessions usually is really good, and it gets even better if the presenting member invites their peers directly instead of me sending out the invitation. And to make people feel belong, we operate on a very personal level, so we welcome every new member in the ch channel, we mention members directly, we greet everyone by name in the meetings, even if, it, if there are 30 people, we try to catch up with the list of joining in people and greet them so they feel seen. And they know that it's not an anonymous mass, but that we know them. Yeah, and from time to time we also chat one-to-one -one with them to find out what they are currently working on, what they find interesting, what pain points they have so we can address them. And if we see that members are working on similar topics, we connect them. Yeah, this again might feel like an effort that is not very well scalable all this personal stuff, but I think we have to acknowledge that introducing a cultural change cannot be scaled from the beginning. The personal engagement builds the foundation for everything else. So going back to the psycholog psychological needs, oh, okay. I highlighted those areas where I see a, a relation to autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Um, for example, yeah, in, in building that positive relationship to the developers and in the process when we introduced the SDSC and the scanning tools and the remediation, remediation strategy, it was important, what I put here on the, on the last point, to trust them to find the best technical solution. And I think that nourishes all three needs the, for autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Via contributing to articles um, or giving sessions, of course, they get visibility, they can show their competence, they, and hopefully they, their uh, need for relatedness is also uh, fulfilled here. Yeah. One question might be, why do we choose the way of motivation and collaboration? There could be other ways. If you read about security culture, security champion programs, community of practice, and so forth, you learn that one of the first steps is to get management buy-in. And that sounds great. And I say that in a way that you might think, huh, it's almost like she put quotation marks. Um, it is very reasonable to have management buy-in, but what if you don't have that management support as strong as needed? How can you do all that with, without having management buy-in uh, with the full understanding what this security culture thing is? But isn't that a reality we face? I can tell from our organization, it is a process. And a bit, I hope, that you can relate to that. So leaders who know and claim that security has become one of the top priorities for business and still focus on episodic interventions and compliance. We chose in our work not to focus on management um, by in, at first for the first activities, but we chose to start with the people who we are actually working with, the people who actually have to implement security into their applications. And we chose to shape our job as security unit in the company in a way that we engage with people instead of throwing tools and requirements at them. As humans, we know that collaboration always is easier than escalation. And of course, there are situations where escalation is necessary. But before we go that way, we always try the collaborative way. We explain, we provide guidance, we help people understand, and we help them to integrate secu a security mindset into their own value system. Because we know this is more effective in the long run. If you burn bridges, you have to build them again for the next interaction, and that is of course, more effort than investing in motivation and collaboration. We also learned from our own experience that culture overrules tools. 
At the beginning, I mentioned that companies spend more and more on security tools and still are not able to reduce the count of breaches. And it is common wisdom that tools don't solve anything just because they are there. Maybe you experienced that as well. The people do with the tools. So in the last part of the session, I want to talk about how we can measure security culture. And it is obvious that it is hard to quantify. Still, we have to show that all of those activities I talked about pay to our goal of improving the security posture of the applications and of the organization. It's not just for fun and pleasure that we, that we do all that. So security is a, security culture is a long-term strategy that needs time to evolve. And one way to measure the success of our activities is a survey that we started for the first time last year and that we are conducting every year now. In the survey, we ask the security champions, we still call them like that, um, for their perception of our security services. And the results from this year, we conducted a survey in March, were encouraging. So we got the feedback that all of our provided services are used, especially security scanning and threat modeling workshops. The Security Champions Network has become the most important channel for skill up and information. Uh, last year it was a newsletter, so this changed. And that is interesting because we put more effort in the Security Champions Network. Around two-thirds of the respondents are sharing information provided by us with their team or a colleague. This is also good for us to know because that is the goal, that they are contrib um, distributors of the knowledge for their teams. Um, yeah, Almost 62% uh, were able to apply the knowledge gained from our service. That is a point where we are not not very, not 100% satisfied. We want to increase that number and find out why why they cannot apply it if they can't. Yeah, we also operate with a net promoter score. That is a thing from marketing. The question is, how likely would you recommend a product or service to a friend or colleague on a scale from 1 to 10? And our net promoter score is 47, which is in the category of favorable. That is very nice for us. <laughs> Other KPIs we fill around with are the participation rate for our event formats, the engagement in the security champions network as far as we can measure that, and the number of topics we gave guidance to. And we also try to delegate security-related tasks and responsibilities to the application teams whenever possible, for example, with the threat modeling skill up. And yeah, the more often this works, and we do spot checks, of course, to see if this works, the more we can trust the evolving security culture and the sweeter the cakes becomes. So, <laughs> and if you are interested uh, in more detailed guidance, I can recommend that you check out the OVA Security Champions Guide. There's a new group forming around that, uh, refreshing the topic. Maybe you know the Security Champions Playbook. And that is a successor of that. I belong to that group as well. And if you're interested, you can follow our activities on LinkedIn. That is the channel that we currently use to inform and share insights and documents. And of course, um, if you have any questions or feedback, or if you want to engage, you can reach out via that channel. And that's all I wanted to say. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, Juliana. This was really, really insightful. Um, I'm going to ask particularly the first question, um, providing obviously um, agile learning. Um, you're also looking into gamification elements to increase engagement or what other types of learning that might engage yeah, developers? Gam gamification is, of course, a topic that comes up regularly and we are not there yet because we don't know how to implement it in a way that it is um, feel, feels useful. We don't want people to just click and show a reaction for a point, but we are not sure yet if that maybe is the right way. So let them click just to get a point and maybe then the mindset evolves or the other way around. Um, 
doing things to, to strengthen the mindset and then add gamification. I'm not sure about that, but that is really uh, a point that is coming up um, repeatedly, yeah. I'm going to go around with the mic to um, have questions asked. Um, do you ensure that you have security champions in each of your 40 teams, or is it kind of whoever is interested so you can have five security champions in one team and then none in the other? Yeah, so the question is, I just repeated for the uh, recording, if uh, we have security champions, two, two you said, per team? No, I'm asking each team. Uh, yeah, if we have in each team or just... Everyone who's interested. Yeah, we, um, at first, we wanted to have a security, two security champions in each team. And then we deviated from that because we just wanted to include everyone who shows interest in security. And we're still working on onboarding more and more teams. And, but if there is anyone else who is interested in security, we don't want to exclude them. So we invite them to the channel, we invite them to our sessions. Yeah. Okay, um, one point regarding the question with the product team, we also did the same thing with making it mandatory per team, two people, and on top, just adding in everyone who's interested. So we also followed the same thing. Um, one thing you mentioned that you didn't make the trainings mandatory. Is that basically rooted in the fact that you said you want to avoid the other two regulations? I don't remember the names, but the externally driven ones that like, uh, was that the reason why you didn't make them mandatory? I guess, right? It was not the reason why we didn't make it mandatory. Okay. Uh, good point though. The training is just not mandatory because there was not enough pressure from management or buy-in. Yeah. Can you elaborate on the messages for the channels? So what type of messages do you post there to encourage? What, what level is it? Is it technical or is it high level? Do you include control, links to controls, which you have somewhere? Or what, what do you post there? Yeah, okay. The, uh, yeah, what do we post in our security champions network? Um, it's a mix. We learned that funny things are not really appreciated. Um, technical stuff is very well appreciated, so they like that. Um, we post general security related topics like, um, teasers to, to articles about security scanning types, for example. If we think they should have a refresh in memory about Zast, then we post something about that or about TLS versions. Um, but also about uh, zero-day vulnerabilities coming up, then we use that channel to inform about that and also give directly our guidance, a security team, what to do now. And that is also some, yeah, that kind of uh, information is also, sh also shared by the security champions. If they find something um, vulnerability-related, they stumble over or they find interesting, they post that, yeah. But also events are announced there. That's another big part. Okay, okay. Oh, great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, to backtrack to the question uh, beforehand about how the program was mandatory and it's optional now, is the goal to eventually get back to mandatory? And if so, what kind of metrics or KPIs are you looking at within the program to then bubble up to show the success of the program? Yeah. So. Uh, if you ask me, I'd say it should be mandatory, but we're working on that to get buy-in on that level. Um, so, and until that happens, it is just um, what is voluntary is the other, <laughs> the, the opposite. Yeah. Um, and if it was mandatory, of course we, yeah, could we have more KPIs there? Of course, yeah. Then we could say we have two security champions per team. Uh, we could maybe make uh, mandatory sessions where they have to participate, like in uh, one talk uh, earlier, two, two talks earlier, I don't know. Uh, they had the whole day every month with the security champions, which is a nice idea. And we, I think, 
if it was mandatory, we could do things like that and not always just ask if they would be so kind to participate. Yeah. Would it be completely wrong to say actually that developers think it should be mandatory and the management is mostly in the way? Well, it can be, yeah. The, they themselves <laughs> like assessments. They do want to do it, but... The developers, they really are interested in learning about security and they mm. would like to do more, as mm. I can see, but they don't get the time and budget for that. Mm. It goes back to management. Yeah. Mm. You had already a question. Sorry. Um, this question, did you speak also with the delivery team or business team to uh, push for security culture and uh, this uh, uh, security champion network? Do you have any resistance from the uh, delivery team? My manager team? does, so I'm not on that level, but my manager does, does and um, yeah, there is resistance, obviously. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's a, pro it's a process and evolving, actually, yeah. Okay, last question, and then we wrap up. <laughs> Hi, thanks for the awesome presentation. I have a question. How big is the team preparing all these trainings, materials, communications, all of that? Especially for that, we have a sub-team where I belong to, and we are two people. Yeah, we, we are doing... Big task. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, we can always ask other people yeah. to, to contribute, to help. For example, if it is about writing a knowledge article, we ask uh, in our team or people we know that are experts in that area. So we, we organize, but we also create ourselves. Yeah. So, Juliana, thank you so much. I'm sure you're available. Yeah, of uh, course. Now, of if course. anyone has more questions, um, but give an applause again for Juliana. Thanks a lot.